we started these uh, family weekend morning readings four or five years ago by chance. We had someone in town and we thought we'd uh, offer this as a, you know, a little treat for visiting uh, families um, because uh, students would still be asleep at this hour. And, um, every year it's grown. I think next year we're going to have to do this in Ross Hall or something. Uh, we really didn't expect this. I, I think the, the truth is that this is all because of Patrick Hudnut. Uh, I think you're all here to see him. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Patrick's mother. And she's also known as Caitlin Flanagan. <laughs> but around Kenyon, we're all known as someone's uh, parent. Um, and, and it's a great treat uh, to introduce Caitlin Flanagan, uh, who is uh, here in celebration partly of uh, Kenyon's 50th year of co-education, an ongoing uh, celebration throughout the year, uh, as well as for uh, Family Weekend. And uh, she will be speaking about uh, uh, six women who've shaped the American mid-century, 20th century, uh, which is a great topic. Caitlin Flanagan is a Pulitzer Prize and National Magazine Award nominee finalist uh, many times over. She was a staff writer for The New Yorker and has been a contributor to The Atlantic, as many of you know, since 2001. She is the author to Hell With All That and Girl Land. And to Hell With All That is for sale at that back table uh, after uh, her talk today. Um, her essays have been widely anthologized, including in Best American Essays, Best American Magazine Writing, and Best American Travel Writing. Her recent essay, They Had It Coming, we just found out about this, it's very exciting. Uh, they Had It Coming about the college admission scandal, not Kenny. <laughs> Could use the help. <laughs> they're, they're three and two. Um, is being adapted for television by Bloomhouse Productions, which is very exciting. Please join me in welcoming uh, Patrick Spock. Thank you. Thank you very much. David had emailed me and said, Everyone likes to sleep in at Kenyon on Saturday, so do you want to come talk early in the morning? It's like, tough gig, but then there are the people, so thank you very much. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of these women that I brought to the Atlantic over the years. But first I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Atlantic, because sometimes people know they kind of group it in with the New Yorker and Harper's, and I think it's a similar type of magazine in terms of readership, but, the, it's, but it also has a very different history. It was founded in 1857 by a group of abolitionists in Boston, including Emerson, and uh, Lincoln was a subscriber. And um, he, uh, there's a famous quote about him saying, if everybody in the country could read this magazine, the war would end already, because it was so clear about um, slavery and the need to end that. And then, next one. Thank you. Um, so the other thing The Atlantic was about was developing the American voice and what is the American idea, and how do we express it. So that there was that whole idea of the great American novel. Can America produce a novel that's to the standard of the great European? My voice is shaking. There's so many people. Caitlin. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, it's the voice of the Oscars. <laughs> um, so so um, the idea was that these writers would come together just as they did, um, the novelists did to kind of figure out what would be an American novel. That the Atlantic writers would figure out what's an American idea and how do we express it over and over. And there are always times, it'll be like annually or at any anniversary, we all have to write about the American idea and sometimes you feel, Ugh, enough of this. But lately, it's like, well, it's still very relevant. And you can see here, <coughs> the company had key. Einstein, Robert Frost. <laughs> Um, uh, Bud Schulberg, but what has helped me is that there was only one woman, and that's how I kind of wedged my way in. There's a there's some women here. Okay, and this was the first, the coverage was the first essay. I had done book reviews for them, but this is when I started the essays. Now, my husband really disagrees with me on this. My feeling is that you don't need to know what you're going to do when you're in college. And, <laughs> and my husband says you should know when you get out and you should have purposeful activity. But my feeling is it's a long road and you'll find out what you're doing. So that's what that is. And then now, to give you the idea of um, the American idea, 
This is Tony E. Z. Coates' very famous essay about reparations, and every single candidate, Democratic candidate, has a position now on reparations, just from this essay. Um, and The Atlantic now is not just a little magazine in Boston. It is a website, it's a movie studio, it's um, podcasts, but still on that idea of the American idea. So, I got the idea. Yeah, you can put her up, Marilyn. <laughs> so they let me in. I'm still not sure why, but I just took it and ran with it. And I just thought, I want to write about the things I love. And I decided, and there were not enough women in the magazine, just let alone writing. There weren't any women being written about. And I always thought that the women of the American mid-century were starting to be looked at in a very reductivist way. All I would ever hear about was patriarchal oppression, sexism, men, and of all those things were true. I thought we should really be looking at these women um, in their own right. They achieved a lot, you know? And they weren't necessarily sort of all the time saying, I can't achieve anything because of men. They were achieving. And so this is, and by the way, this is what a feature should look like. This is a really good art directed feature. I think. <laughs> a big, beautiful photograph, really clear text. We go in and out on that. But, um, <laughs> lingo there. Um, so, Marilyn now, she's just kind of become like a meme for sexuality, or 50s sexuality, or um, sexuality that's just dominated by men and the male gaze. But she's a really interesting figure. And um, sometimes when I'm writing about someone, I like to write a really dense paragraph that kind of goes through like really quickly so many facts that are of a certain theme that by the end of the paragraph the reader's like, oh, she's really made her point. Mm -hmm. And with Marilyn, she's kind of a little bit like people like Hemingway where you look at their history and they just, they almost knew everyone that was famous at the time in a different way. <laughs> and I really got this idea when I found out, so you know she was a foster child, her mother kept dropping her off back and forth to orphanages in LA. And, uh, and, but when I found out that she'd been baptized by Amy Semple McPherson, who's like this huge character in America 20s and 30s in LA, this huge Pentecostal minister, I was like, wow, Marilyn was really everywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> this is um, just a paragraph about her and that. <clears throat> Marilyn Monroe. Okay. How to do it right by Marilyn. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe was baptized by Amy Semple McPherson, analyzed by Anna Freud, befriended by Carl Sandburg and Edith Sitwell, romanced, if you can call it that, by Jack and Bobby Kennedy, painted by William de Kooning, taught acting by Michael Chekhov and Lee Strasberg, photographed by Richard Avedon, on Cecil Beaton, and Henry Cartier on Cartier Bresson. She managed on the strength of limited dramatic talent and within a studio system that paid no attention to individual ambition to work with some of the greatest directors in movie history, twice with John Huston, Billy Wilder, and Howard Hawks, and once each with George Cooker, Joseph Mankiewicz, and Laurence Olivier. She was the first Playboy centerfold and one of the first women to own her own production company. She was a nudist and a champion of free love long before those concepts emerged into the national consciousness. She maintained a deep association with the American military that all on its own lent her mythic stature. When the Second World War broke out, she became both a teenage war bride and an actual Rosie the Riveter. Long days spent working in the fuselage varnishing room of the radio plane plant in Burbank. Her first cheesecake photographs were taken in the spirit of morale boosters for the boys overseas. Her famous appearance in Korea, wriggling on stage in her purple sequin dress, popping her glorious plat platinum head out of the hatch. Uh, ah, my voice is shaking to so many of you. Of her camouflage during day, rolling her to the next appearance, remains the standard against which any American sex symbol sent to entertain the troops is measured. She was the first celebrity to talk openly about her childhood sexual abuse, a kind of admission that has become so common today we hardly take notice of it. But to tell reporters in the 1950s that you have been raped as an eight-year-old, and to do so without shame, but rather with a justifiable sense of fury and vengeance, it was a breathtaking act of self-assurance. So I just wanted to make the point in this long essay that she was a woman in her own right. She, just, she wasn't just an oppressed person. She created a lot of things. She was a tragic figure. 
she died very young from a drug overdose. But that was that was where I started to get the idea to to bring these women into their own right. And then who do we have? Who do we have next, Elizabeth? <laughs> oh, Patty, Patty, Patty. Okay. <laughs> the young people. Do you know about Patty Hearst? I was. I grew up in Berkeley, and Patty Hearst was. And everywhere in Berkeley, Hearst Boulevard, Hearst Amphitheaters, um, the beautiful um, Phoebe Apperson Hearst Gymnasium that was this kind of gothic, Romeo you know, Beaux Arts building on campus, and the whole newspaper chain, the Hearst family, Citizen Kane. And so she was this very wealthy girl, and from this family, William Randolph Hearst was her father, Junior, and she was kind of doing the things her parents wanted her to do. This was her engagement photograph, and so they liked that she like had her engagement photograph in the newspaper. But eh, Stephen Wee, they didn't like him, and she was living with him, which is really bad. So, anyways, <laughs> what happened was this small revolutionary group called the SLA, the Symbionese Liberation Army. They um, had really strong revolutionary ideas, but they didn't really have the goals for those ideas. But they kind of brutally kidnapped Patty Hearst. And in Berkeley, that was all anybody could talk about. We, we just, it just, this notion that she was around somewhere, because they kept being these audio tapes that would be left at local radio stations. And um, there would be um, communiques that would come in. And sometimes she would be in San Francisco, sometimes she would be in Berkeley, sometimes in other Alameda places. And we would all sort of wonder, could we find her? And, and then there was this very famous moment where she apparently, it's a big, one of the big questions of the 1970s, she joined the um, Symbionese Liberation Army and became one of them. And there was just this shocking moment where um, the, the latest communique came with this photograph and her voice was different and she joined the SLA. So the question was, of course, was she brainwashed girls that were supposed to be a certain way in the culture? were changing and were leaving and were abandoning their parents' ideas for what they were supposed to be. And it was, and she kind of stood for that, I think. I think she stood for the idea that a daughter could leave and change. And uh, I'll just give you a paragraph on that idea. The thing you have to understand about Patty Hearst, the reason that her fantastically sui generis story, that's a horrible phrase, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> The reason that her unusual story resonated so deeply within so many millions of ordinary American households is that back then a lot of girls like her were disappearing. They were not California publishing heiresses, certainly, nor was the agency of their disappearance abduction at, at gunpoint. But disappear they did. One moment their lives could be summed up in a series of photographs not so different from the ones flashed on the night news over and over again. Patty in a first communion dress at age eight smiling with her gaggle of glossy-haired sisters as a young adolescent, sitting quietly, dreamily, inwardly on the floor beside her mother's chair as a teenager, staring off into the mists of Girlland, and the next moment gone. So she was a revolutionary manque, or I guess you could say the revolution was forced upon her, and then I kind of snuck Angela in here. I haven't finished the piece. And then I also snuck Toni Morrison in here. Yeah. It's such a great photograph. Um, Jill Cremins is the photographer in a lot of the great 70s photographs that you see. Most of the East Coast ones. They're black and white. You'll probably see that she's the photographer. But Angela Davis was, you know, she was from um, Birmingham, Alabama. But she was an intellectual. She, um, by senior year of high school, she was in New York, she was studying in Greenwich um, Village at a private high school. She um, was a communist, she studied with Marcuse in, the, in Frankfurt. And when I was in like third grade, everybody had a free Angela Davis button in my classroom. And I was like, I want a free Angela Davis button. And my parents who were super lefty, didn't want me to have a free Angela Davis button because she had, She's way ahead on things that are going on today in the culture. She was, she really understood that prison reform was at the center of everything. And she had bought the guns, <clears throat> guns that were used um, in an attempt to free some men from um, a courthouse and four people were killed. But she was ultimately exonerated of it. Um, so I should have gotten that button. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I just, 
she was just very loom large in my early, early childhood. And this idea that I grew up in Berkeley, I mean, obviously it's all things very autobiographical, but the idea that there were these two revolutionary characters, the one who was, I won't say she was playing at revolution, but she got kind of forced into revolution and then she came out and was very wealthy again. And then this one very serious woman um, with a PhD and um, incredible writing, and she's still alive. So that's yet to come, next year. Okay. This was this interesting thing that happened. So, you know, there's always books about the Kennedys, constantly. So a few years ago, this woman, Mimi Alfred, she came up with this little book. She'd been an intern at the White House, and it was a book about a private sexual relationship that she had with John Kennedy. And I just assumed everyone was going to say, you don't have the proof, we reject it, it's not true. But by this point, everybody in the Kennedy family was like, oh, we accept it, you know, bring them on. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't even fight it, that this was her. And, um, so it's kind of interesting in um, the way we might think of this relationship today versus in, the, in that era. So this came out, and then very coincidentally, or maybe not, um, these 10 hours of audio tapes were published after John Kennedy was killed. Four months later, Jackie Kennedy gave these long, intimate, kind of drunken, flirtatious um, interviews with Arthur Schlesinger, and they were finally made available. And people were like, who wants to listen to 10 hours of this? I was like, I want to listen to 20 hours of that. So I listened to all these tapes, and then I listened, to, and then I read this short book, and I, um, I got a horrible scoop, so here's my horrible scoop. People always like talk about this, but it's, I think it's very sad. Um, my Jackie Kennedy scoop is that, oh, someone gets me. Okay. Everyone's waiting. What's the scoop? Okay, so she's really myth making on these tapes. She created everything we know about them, that holiday of Camelot. She created that, and right after the death, that it was a, a certain kind of marriage, and the, the children were so close to them, and they did all these things, and she just told this story. And you can hear Arthur Schlesinger falling in love with her, very much so. She was like a Marilyn Monroe in that, that way, that um, they slept with the same man. No, in that she could <laughs> tell these, you know, beguiling stories. Um, so, most of all, um, you get the sense of a young couple busy with children and figuring it all out, as all young couples must, how to occupy and distract them. You've got to get me some books or something. I'm running out of children's stories, he once told Jackie, after trying to make up get another story for Caroline. Another time, he asked Jackie to buy some toys for his bathroom because John would wander in while he was bathing and he had nothing to entertain him with. So Jackie bought some rubber ducks, which led to a fond family story. Um, the bathroom that male dinner guests had use of was JFK's, causing Jackie to imagine what in the world they would think when they saw all those rubber ducks lined up on the edge of the president's tub. <laughs> very, very thrilled. So then, um, so those audio tapes were made in, what, 63? Is that when he was killed? 63? Yeah. Then this was written just a couple of years ago, her long, secretive thing. Um, Above all, she tells us about, so she's, they're talking about the same time, having the same lover, but husband and lover. So she's like, wonderful family, rubber ducks and everything. Then she's telling us, above all, she reports John Kennedy was playful. The two lovers especially enjoyed getting it on in his bathroom, which they turned into their own mini spa, outfitted as it was with thick white towels, luxurious soaps, and fluffy white bathrobes, embossed with the presidential seal. But there was something else in that wonderful, elegant bathroom of his that Mimi thinks reveals so much about his true nature. Something she wants to tell us about for the unique insight it gives into the man. In addition to all of the grown-up accoutrements, he also had his very own collection of, wait for it, rubber ducks. Can you imagine the President of the United States collected rubber ducks? Well, he did. And Mimi, unlike super sophisticated Jackie, knew how to have fun with something like that. This was one of the special things she was able to bring to the relationship. <laughs> she and Jack gave the ducks funny names, and they had bathtub races for them, and it was like a sexy play date. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was in my office, and I was like, yeah, take it all. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like if it were a novel, it would be too much. You know? <laughs> These two women talking about the same man, the same thing, and, and I realized 
both of those relationships were legitimate relationships. I'm sure it was a sexy, fun time raising the ducks. <laughs> and I'm sure it was a lovely moment when he asked her to get ducks for the children. And, um, and then what we really learned is that men are bastards. No. <laughs> within this marriage that we will never really know it in, in any way. So people were very touched by that. And I was like, wow, I've got a scoop from 57 years ago. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well. Joan Didion. Uh, there's two more from that series you could do. There's one more and we have more. These are the famous uh, Julian Wasser photos. And uh, I don't know if that one. Is it too late to go back? No, she's like, well, we can keep that. That's fine. Um, the ones with the Corvette, um, Julian Wasser is a great photographer of the 1970s on the West Coast. Anytime you see a really cool photograph of somebody, Julian Wasser took it um, half the time. And the question was asked to him, I just read this recently, oh, yeah, Joe Didion. He's, somebody said, why did you let her take all the photographs in the car? And he said, you don't tell that kind of woman what to do. <laughs> and um, so I had, I guess, this youthful brush with greatness in that, so this is um, reporting the big piece for her first book, Sajin Toward Bethlehem. And she was living in LA at the time. And uh, she, she was invited up to Berkeley for a semester as a regents lecturer. And, uh, my father was the English department chair. So um, I spent time with her when I was just a kid, but she really affected me. I think she's the, that time was the reason I became a writer. And at any time in my life that I feel really lost, um, I always read some Joan Didion. And I just had a little bit in my paperwork. Okay. Okay, this is the thing, it's really gendered and I thought, should I change this because it's so different today? And I thought, no, because she wrote at a certain time. And um, when things were heavily gendered, and she was very sensitive to, to like what kind of woman she was and what kind of man John Gregory Dunn, her husband, was. And um, I say in here that she was, she was kind of for the girls. She was this beautiful writer. And then you had Hunter Thompson, who you know was this great writer, and he had these ink blot pictures that um, decorated or illustrated, I should say, his books. And I loved Hunter Thompson too. But there was this idea growing up that Joan Didion had this really particular way of being a woman because she was fearless. She would report on things that, you know, she was a slight little woman. She would report she was so smart. You just read her things and you just sense that she's just standing outside that room, outside you know, any kind of conversation, she's observing it and she's above it at the same time. And yet, she was hyper-feminine. It is, still alive, obviously. Hyper-feminine. So, um, women who encountered Joan Didion when they were young received from her a way of being female and being writers that no one else could give them. She was our Hunter Thompson, and slouching toward Bethlehem was our fear and loathing in Las Vegas. He gave the boys twisted pig fuckers and quarts of tequila. She gave us quiet days in Malibu and flowers in our hair. We were somewhere around Barstow on the edge of the desert when the drugs began to take hold, Thompson said. All I ever did to that apartment was hang 50 yards of yellow theatrical silk across the bedroom windows because I had some idea that the gold light would make me feel better, Didion wrote. To not understand the way those two statements would reverberate in the minds of respect is to not know very much at all about those types of creatures. Thompson's work was illustrated by Ralph Steadman's grotesque ink blots and early Didion by the ravishing photographs of the mysterious girl woman sitting bare-legged on a stone balustrade, posing behind the wheel of her yellow Corvette, wearing an elegant silk gown and staring off into space, all alone in a chic living room. And here's why I want to do everything I said about waiting to find your career. Because maybe you should figure out your career really early. Because <laughs> It was those first two books of essays that she wrote really young, that she, she just wrote them on, she wrote them against deadline, she wrote them for money, she published them in the Saturday Evening Post, all those famous essays that were just super sophisticated and the Saturday Evening Post was not super sophisticated. She was just getting a check because she wanted to write these novels and these screenplays. 
Well, those first two books, Sachi Toward Bethlehem and the White Album, those are what made her whole career. And anytime somebody tells you, I love Joan Didion, I always know they're going to be talking about an essay that was written 40 years ago mm -hmm. from one of those two collections. Um, <coughs> oh, they have the toggle. This is the toggle. Okay. I become like this mad woman with these papers. What time is it? Like, I feel like I'm. Um, what do you call it? Robert Frost at the inauguration when his poem blew away. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is Barbara Walters, whom you might not think is worthy of an essay in the American Ideas magazine. She's just a great character. She, I mean, sadly now she's um, very much in decline and in seclusion, but she she doesn't need to be written back into history because she was writing herself into history at every turn. She's kind of pushy and unbearable in some respects. But she just, she had grown up, well, let me tell you what has she grown up. It's really, I was about to say it's really good. I realized I wrote it, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth waiting for, it's worth waiting for. Um, okay. Hers has been a big showbiz life, one in which a certain type of snub, the bad table at an important party, the misspelling of her daughter's name on a personal note, rankles for decades, and in which kindnesses register on a meter that is highly sensitive and always running, Princess Diana walking Barbara not just to the door of Kensington Palace, but all the way to her car, Richard and Dorothy Rogers ensuring that her suitcases were unpacked and her clothes hung up or folded in tissue paper when she arrived at their sumptuous house for weekends. Bing Crosby's butler wrapping up a deathbed souvenir, a pair of reading glasses, and sending it to Barbara's mother. And the whole thing with her, her father was a nightclub owner, which she was kind of embarrassed about. And he owned these kind of burlesque clubs that were called the Latin Quarter. There was one in Miami and one in New York. And they were, you know, women would dance, maybe not completely nude, but, but pretty much. And she spent a lot of time there as a child. And she did get the idea that between being on stage in the floodlights and then being backstage, kind of taken off the makeup of looking at the bus schedule, that somewhere between those two things was something important, which was fame. And what fame could do for you were in the lights and, and be behind them. But she was very, very, very class conscious and always felt that she was not accepted in society because her father was this nightclub owner. And what killed her, so young people, it it's, goes back a long way, was not getting into Wellesley. This just <laughs> killed her. And like Diane Sawyer, Hillary Clinton, all the people in her circle had gone to Wellesley. And she always felt, and she went to Sarah Lawrence, which to us would be like, well, that's fantastic. You know, cool, progressive, interesting education. She didn't want a cool, progressive, interesting education. She wanted, you know, everything very traditional. She wanted this kind of sinister of, of acceptance. And so she always, always felt she was being snubbed. So it wasn't all perfect. It wasn't all easy. You tried flirting with Dick Nixon for four punishing years of White House dinners. <laughs> <laughs> and ding bat late night phone calls, only to have him give the big Watergate interview to David Frost. <laughs> You try adding a bit of fun to a one-hour special by showing viewers a glimpse of your own New York apartment in, in between exclusive interviews with a reclusive movie star and the president-elect, and then wake up to morally safer broadcasting sandwiched between the white bread of the Carters and the pumpernickel of Streisand. We were treated to the pastrami of Ms. Walters herself. <laughs> sure, it was hard when the Bennett surfs dropped her like typhoid Mary when she ticked off Sinatra. And yes, it was painful when her only child plunged into drugs and ran away from home. But this is not a list of regrets. This is not a settling of scores. Didn't Duke Wayne himself tell her not to let the bastards get her down? Um, she, uh, she just had this feeling that she was always in a fight. She was always trying to be accepted, and she, but she was also trying to merge her way into celebrities' lives. So the whole thing with the Barbara Walters interview 
was that of the late ones, the celebrity ones, it would always be, no matter what hell you've been through, you are currently in the happiest <laughs> chapter of your life. That was the key of her interviews. Mm -hmm. And the celebrities would be like, if she'll say that about me, I'll tell her everything. <laughs> so, like the Kirstie Allen one is really classic because she brings Kirstie Allen through every possible horrible and embarrassing thing. <coughs> and at the end, Barbara, Al Barbara Walters always reviews them. So, Kirstie Alley has faced Scientology, drug addiction, huge weight gain, abandonment by her husband, inability to get to work, but right now, she's the happiest. She's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> I always like that. You just wait for those. And they were really fulfilling because you could hear all the scandally dirt, but then you're like, oh, she's the happiest she's ever been. <laughs> autobiography that she wrote, um, let's make this clear. These celebrities do not write their books. Don't ever think they do. Like they might type a little or something, but <laughs> they just, and certainly like this, the scale is for her life. They always have somebody to write with them or for them. But in this huge book, Audition, which was her memoir, published shortly before she really kind of disappeared from public life, there were a lot of quotations from interviews she'd had early on with famous people. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, she was doing those interviews at the time of the new journalism, back say in the 70s, her 70s interviews, when, you know, all these big, big cats like Joan Didion, Gay Talese, um, Tom Wolfe, Terry Southern, it was all about spending time with a famous person and getting the perfect quote and putting it in your essay and just feeling like, oh, you really established a relationship and you really had an ear for dialogue and you wrote it down. Well, I just, in reading this huge book, I started noticing the quality of the quotes that she was getting from celebrities and how apt they were. And I started realizing, in a certain way, you could make a case. I knew everyone was going to say, no, it's the pastrami. But you could make a case that she was kind of a new journalist in the way that she was revealing characters. So I just have written some of these quotes down from this essay. So this is what she um, thought, this is what Judy Garland said to um, Barbara Walters. All this is on camera. So, you know, Judy Garland, she comes three hours late for the interview, she's on drugs, she'll be dead in two years, everything's kind of a wreck. And she says, the only mistake I ever made, the only harm I ever did, was sing Over the Rainbow. It's a good Judy Garland quote. <laughs> and uh, she interviewed Truman Capote after the publication of In Cold Blood. And he said, the only thing I couldn't do without is my own conviction about my own creative gifts. Mm -hmm. I'll read that again. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I couldn't do without is my own conviction about my own creative gifts. Mm -hmm. Then she interviewed Rose Kennedy, um, the parent of John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy, and um, she interviewed him, on the, her, on the fifth anniversary of Jack's death and five months after Bobby had been shot. And at this point, um, four of her children had been killed or were dead. Um, and she asked her, how did, you, how did you get through this? And she said, I just made up my mind that I was not going to be vanquished. Um, and Bing Crosby had very famously said that he would disown his daughter if she ever had sex outside of marriage. And she said, do you really mean it? And he said, aloha on the steel guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jean Harris, which I know the young people don't know. So she, did any girls here, women, go to um, Madeira? My sister. Oh, she did? OK, at the time of Jean Harris. Do you want to tell them who Jean Harris is? So Jean Harris was a crazy lady who became <laughs> the head of the girls' boarding school. And she ended up um, killing her lover. And do you remember what the lover did, though? Yeah, he, he was, was the stars of He was the stars of Diane Guy. Yes. <laughs> she fell in love with Dr. Townhour, who had just published The Scarsdale Diet. I mean, my own parents were on The Scarsdale Diet. So I was, oh, my God. And they had an affair, and then he was not, um, he was not sticking with her, with Jean Harris. And she shot him dead. And people always said it was because she caught him sneaking a chicken leg. But I'm sure that was <laughs> actually just very angry to see her affair. But so she had to go to prison, I mean real prison. And so she's this kind of girls, fancy girls boarding school. Um, 
you know, headmistress, and now she's in prison. So um, finally, when she got out, Barbara got the interview, and she said, "Well, what was it like in prison?" And she, Jean Harris said, "Well, I wanted to try to help them make Visitors' Day run more smoothly." <laughs> so, okay, how did you do that? And Jean Harris said, "I kept saying to them." Please let me have the list, and I'll arrange it alphabetically for you. <laughs> and the guard said to me, it won't do any good because they don't arrive alphabetically. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I just have one other thing about her to read, because I really think she's a great character. Like, we're laughing at her? Mm, yes. But but no, these are guests that she got. We're laughing, with her. we're laughing with her. Thank you, or at least near her. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. She was just. I think she's just a really cool person who achieved a lot. And um, so, this is that dense paragraph that I like to write about them. Um, Today is a muddle, but yesterday is Byzantium, all hammered gold and precious jewels. Barbara Walters has known presidents and kings, famous call girls and genteel murderers. Nobel Prize winners and dumb, dumb blondes who have changed the world. She has floated on the Dead Sea by Moon Man in his backyard. She has been to the ancient city of Persopolis to observe the 2,500 year anniversary of the Persian monarchy, where 50 yellow and blue tents had been erected by Jansen of Paris, the hot interior decorator, ah. and filled with Limoges, Baccarat, Porto of Linen, <coughs> two tons of Iranian caviar. She has chatted in a palace garden with Princess Grace, eaten prime ribbon potatoes off TV dinner trays with Catherine Hepburn, bounced around the Reagan Ranch in Ronnie's favorite Jeep, motorboated across the Bay of Pigs with Fidel Castro, risked a nighttime landing in Baghdad and a Baghdad blackout to interview Saddam Hussein, but it been admitted into Muammar Gaddafi's desert tent, where she worried that her pink knit suit would clash with the general's green and white mufti, Bro brokered and conducted the first joint interview with Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin and pressed her body tight to Syl Sylvester Stallone while his Harley roared between their legs. So she was, that, just that thing with Marilyn Monroe, I just think it's really interesting, these characters who, um, of their moment, kind of know so many people and kind of Zelig-like, you know that movie, kind of insert themselves in so many moments. And then I think we're going to finish with, <coughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wrote a really big piece about Oprah Winfrey because I think she's. Oh. <laughs> it's not really a great picture. It was after her last show when she had the big two not two day extravaganza, and I was like, Oprah has always kind of gone back and forth about writing an autobiography, and she's even had deals, and everybody was so excited that she would. And then she kept backing out. But she has really the most incredible life story in a sense of any American. She grew up as poor as it is possible to be in modern America. And yet she had this very clear idea from like age three of what she wanted to do with her life. And if I can fish out my paper on it, I will tell you what she wanted, to, how she did it. But she was, you know, she had a baby at age 14, the baby died. She was brutally, sort of sexually <coughs> molested by two men in her family. And, and she just achieved all this stuff. And as somebody said about her, all her life, she's been um, lifting someone up with, this, with one hand while she lifts herself up with the other. I think Gail said that about her. I might have to wing it, but I can. Um, oh, I know where it is. So what I wanted to do was to kind of write her biography through her, through her, all the trails that she left. And I can't find it, so I can tell it to you because I really know it. <coughs> so she was, from the age of three, she would preach at her family's church and be asked for it and she would recite Invictus. And she just said, always said at the age of three she knew she was born for something. And something big and she wasn't sure what it was but she was going to find it out. And then when she was I think eight or nine, 
she was watching television and Diana Ross came on, the Ed Sullivan show. And she missed almost the whole thing because she said she was running through the apartment screaming, black person on television, black person on television, because there were no black people on television. And the same thing happened when Sidney Poitier got to the Oscars. She did that because it was, television was just to her the highest form of bringing her life in a terrible place into these beautiful lives and these beautiful spaces. And she had this idea very early on that if she could get inside that world, that she could be the kind of person she wanted to be. She lost the child, and when she lost the child, her mother, well, she got pregnant, her mother threw her out. What? Um, she, her mother threw her out, so she went to her father's house, and the first thing he said is, if you ever get pregnant, um, I'd rather see you dead in the river than you to be pregnant. And she thought, here I am pregnant, I'm gonna have to tell him. So she did have the baby, and um, the baby died a few days later. And, and then she never had children, obviously, but she, um, she, the whole story of her growing up explains a lot of her career. Like she had a lot of broken relationships in her childhood, and then in her show, and even today, there's so many reunion episodes. You know, like getting people back together. She, all the painful things that she experienced ended up being huge television because people really relate to that. Losing people you love, just losing track of them, getting back together, and the idea that if you suffered so much deprivation that to have material goods, to have luxury, you've been kind of hollowed out in a special way to experience that and to enjoy that, and that it's incumbent upon you to pass that along and somehow try to give that to someone else. And so what I did was I wrote this biography of her, it's pretty long, and I really trained it, connected it to the religion of her childhood. Because when you go through, and she said the last line of her last television show was to the glory, to God be the glory. So it was kind of this long, you know, 20 year testament um, to, to her faith that got her to this incredible place. And she wasn't like, oh, prosperity gospel, I want to be rich. She was not doing that. She was just saying, I want to be, I want to be of maximum service. So these are these women that I have written about. There are many other in the archives. But the main thing I want to say about them, hmm, I should have written a conclusion. Um, <laughs> in conclusion, I think they're, um, I think, as I keep saying, that I always ask people to look at the history of women a little differently. Because, yes, there was the patriarchy. That's interesting for a sentence. Uh, you know, okay, stipulated. But let's find out what they achieved and what they did and let's find out what they did, not in spite of that um, situation, but in a sense because of it. Because they were forced to do different things, how did they thrive in those worlds? And now, I will take any questions <laughs> that you have. Yes.